So we won the evangelicals. We won with young. We won with old. We won with highly educated. We won with poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. We all love the poorly educated. Donald Trump touting his big win across all demographics last month in Nevada. He is bringing in a lot of new voters to the GOP. We've seen that in some of these primary states that have already taken place. Now let's look ahead to Pennsylvania, which holds its primary next month on April 26th. Yesterday was the deadline to register. It is a closed primary, so you have to pick a party if you want to vote. And a lot of people have picked a party. In fact, a lot are changing. At least 128,000 voters have changed their party affiliation just since January 10th. Nearly 85,000 were previously Democrats coming over to the Republican side. About 42,000 were independents or third party voters. They want to have a say in this primary. The GOP also racked up more than 55,000 first time voter registrants. Meanwhile, the Democrats appear to be losing voters in other places, too. We talked about this a while back. Since the beginning of the year, about 20,000 Massachusetts voters have dropped their Democratic Party affiliation, according to that state's election chief. He says Donald Trump may be the reason for the shift because of his ability to excite voters on both sides of the aisle. And you may remember that Trump won the Massachusetts primary back on Super Tuesday with almost 50 percent of the vote. Let's go ahead and bring in today's roundtable. Joining us now, Maggie Gallagher. She's the senior editor at thepulse2016.com. Also with us, Bree Payton, staff writer for The Federalist. Ladies, thanks for being with us today. Thanks. Great to All be right. here. All right, so this trend raises a few questions. Democrats flocking to the GOP in Pennsylvania, independents as well. We mentioned how this is happening in Massachusetts, and I imagine if we had the stats, it'd be happening in a lot of places as well. Maggie, first with you, why do you think this is? Well, I think in Pennsylvania, it may be the Trump factor, but you're also seeing an awful lot of Kasich support developing there. Trump is up by only three points in the latest poll. It's 33 for Trump, 30 for Kasich, and 20 for Cruz. Frankly, I think it reflects even more that Hillary is a really uninspiring candidate who seems to have locked up the nomination. And uh, I think Republicans in general are highly motivated and highly energized. Uh, Hillary would be the third term of Obama, so I think you're seeing people uh, moving over to the anti-Hillary column. And then I think, in, you know, in addition, Pennsylvania has never really mattered before in the presidential uh, mm. campaign. And so you're probably seeing some latent uh, voters coming over uh, just because it's the first time they've had a chance to make a difference. And that's one of the great things about this election year. States like Pennsylvania, all the way to California, are going to matter when they really haven't mattered in the past. We're going to learn a lot about these states. Bree, what do you think is the bigger factor? The effort to stop Donald Trump, uh, the, the, the voter fatigue, the, the lack of enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton, or are people really excited about John Kasich in Pennsylvania? That is the state of his birth. <laughs> I really find it hard to believe that anyone would get excited about John Kasich <laughs> in any circumstance, personally. So <laughs> I find the Kasich excitement argument to be a little bit tough to buy. Um, however, I do think what we are seeing is that, uh, that you know, we definitely are seeing some Hillary fatigue, but I also think that Donald Trump is really tapping into a lot of ire and a lot of concerns that voters have. I think that voters are really sick of these elite pieties that we're hearing in regards to immigration and foreign policy, and I think Donald Trump as the least polite candidate um, <laughs> in all areas, but especially in those areas are, you know, he's really tapping into what voters kind of want to hear. Um, I think with the latest news regarding um, ISIS and terrorism and the growing threat of that going on, I think that voters are really just eager to hear someone who is willing to call it what it is and, you know, is willing to um, put aggressive uh, hold holds on immigration and migrants coming in. Um, even if that person is a little abrasive or rough about it, I think they find that refreshing. Yeah, Pennsylvania is an interesting state. You know, you, you got Senator Pat Toomey, uh, who's a Republican, but he worked with Joe Manson on that gun control bill, something that a lot of Republican senators wouldn't even dare touch with a 10-foot pole. They got a Democratic governor who seems to be pretty popular after a Republican governor who wasn't so popular left office, uh, not under the best circumstances. Uh, but these are the factors that are, that are coming into play here. And, and you know, I'm going to make a prediction or an assessment that I've made in the past, and I've been wrong about it in the past, but you're seeing some trends in the polls. We talked about Wisconsin with Ted Cruz now up on Donald Trump in Wisconsin, John Kasich surging uh, in Pennsylvania. It does appear, uh, given with all this tawdry details, uh, and now with this Corey Lewandowski thing, that there might be some people reaching 
their limit with Donald Trump, even if you were amused, if he's drawn you into the, the presidential election thus far. Uh, people are talking about Belgium and we're looking at terrorism, which had, has benefited Donald Trump in the past. But right now it doesn't seem to be helping. Even if you look at his head to head matchups with Hillary Clinton in the real clear politics average over the last month of March, he's been tanking. Hillary Clinton has been gaining on him in that particular head to head matchup. What do you guys think, Maggie? First to you. Yeah. Well, I think the Corey thing is a fake scandal, uh, except for the fact that they denied it happened. It, it would be a non-story. Big scrum, uh, reporter gets shoved, don't call her a liar. But I do agree that well, the real thing that's happening is geographically, we are moving into the Midwest. And, you know, they like their politics nice in the Midwest. They, they are still a kind of good government, a lot of goo-goo, clean clean talk and sentiment and the sort of whole big man swaggering and braggering thing that turned out to work really well in the south among the uh, so-called evangelicals really is i think not going to play well in wisconsin i think pennsylvania is a little more like ohio maybe than than bray recognizes and that m may be why we're seeing case that gets some traction there that he hasn't gotten in other uh, states. But the map, you know, the, the fundamental way most re political reporters have been reporting the map, which is that Ted Cruz is the evangelical candidate because he won Iowa, and that means he won't play well elsewhere, just fundamentally misreads. Uh, the biggest problem Trump has is not ideology or politics. It's that either you like the kind of big man swaggering, baggering style where he says outrageous things, or you really don't like it, you don't trust it, you don't think uh, a man who acts like that is someone you can trust to be president. And so I think in New York and New Jersey, maybe parts of Pennsylvania, it'll play well, but in the Midwest and in California, I think Trump is running into some problems uh, and it has to do less with the ideology, which is how we usually interpret pro uh, politics and with kind of the culture of what's an acceptable way to act in public. Bree, with about 30 seconds left, you know, there's only one primary next Tuesday. If Ted Cruz, this trend line continues and he does wind up beating Donald Trump, there's no way he can claim victory Donald Trump can. How damaging would that be for Trump? Well, obviously, it would be very damaging if he <laughs> you know, lost, that, um, lost that primary as this whole brand is built on winning and um, winning by large margins and winning and crushing everyone, right? So I think that would definitely put a dent um, in that image that he's trying to project. Yeah, well, uh, you know, nowhere to hide. One primary, everybody we focused on that one state. A lot of people diving into the numbers, who voted for whom, who broke late. A lot of late-breaking late, uh, late -breaking voters going for Ted Cruz. We're coming back. We're going to talk about Paul Ryan, a Wisconsin native, with our roundtable right after this. Welcome back to Newsmax. Now we are still standing by. Donald Trump expected to give campaign rally here any moment in Janesville. You're looking live at the venue. Not sure if he will address the situation with Corey Lewandowski during his stump speech tonight. Anything happens, we'll let you know about it. Meanwhile, President Obama calls for Congress to do more about the nationwide drug epidemic. We have proposed in our budget an additional billion dollars for drug treatment programs in counties all across the country. And my hope is, is that uh, all the advocates and folks and families who are here and those who are listening uh, say to Congress, this is a priority. The president is also calling for treating drug addiction as a health issue instead of a criminal problem. At least eight people, including one gunman, were injured, or one German, I should say, not a gunman, a German, were injured during a fireworks explosion in western Poland. It happened earlier this afternoon. Six cars were also damaged. Police are investigating the cause of the blast. Nepalese folks are taking shelter during a powerful dust storm in Kathmandu. The dust storm brought traffic to a standstill. Some parts of the country went dark for 15 minutes when the dust blocked out the sun. And Fox News correspondent Geraldo Rivera poking fun at Donald Trump, not Paul Ryan, in case you missed it on Dance with the Stars. You know what happened. Geraldo got kicked off at Dance with the Stars. All right, let's move on now. A tough break for Riviera on Dance with the Stars. We wish him well. Meanwhile, House Speaker Paul Ryan is criticizing, quote, the ugliness of the current political discourse. Ryan said uh, earlier that today politics is degrading, a politics that's going to be the base, the basis of our emotions, of what disunifies us, not what unifies us, talking about the current events. Ryan never mentioned Donald Trump by name in that speech he gave a little while ago. The House Speaker has tried to remain neutral, but he's having a very difficult time given all the challenges he's faced and Donald Trump has put in his way. Many think Ryan could actually launch his own bid 
for the White House in 2020. The Hill writes today, quote, with his youth and Sonny Reagan-esque message, Ryan could be a formidable White House candidate in the years to come. Ryan has never voiced any interest in running for president. In fact, he's told people he is not running for president. He did actually send a cease and desist letter to a draft Paul Ryan for president group. But he made the same noises back when the GOP was looking for a new House Speaker to replace John Boehner. Four years is a long time from now, and that's a great place to bring in today's roundtable. And now, not four years from now. All right, joining us again, Maggie Gallagher, the senior editor at the Pulse2016.com, and Bree Payton, writer for The Federalist. This Paul Ryan stuff just does not seem to be going away. And now we're talking about 2020. Bree, how would you feel about <laughs> Paul Ryan as a GOP nominee in 2020? I'd be happy with that. <laughs> I find it really hard to believe that he would be a nominee, though. Um, I, you know, after he ran as Romney's running mate in 2012, he talked about how, you know, just burned out that made him feel, um, and how how reluctant he was to pursue that kind of thing again. So I think if he does pursue that, I think that um, he would do so hesitantly, like he did with the speakership position, and may, perhaps almost reluctantly. Yeah, I mean, you know, things set up for 2020, if Republicans are talking about this, this essentially means they are conceding the 2016 presidential election, Maggie. <laughs> uh, I still think, though, if Paul Ryan were to have an opportunity to become the nominee during the convention, he'd have to take that uh, opportunity. I mean, he doesn't want to run against Hillary Clinton in 2020, right? Listen, if there is one thing that the voters are screaming, the Republican voters are screaming, is that they are dissatisfied with the establishment in Washington that as Speaker of the House, whether he likes it or not, Paul Ryan is the head of. And it's nothing personal against Ryan, who I think is an attractive guy in a lot of ways. But the idea that the antidote to Trump is going to be, if assuming we're going to concede Trump the nomination, it's going to be a massive slaughter. And then people will want a Washington insider the next time. I think it's a fundamental misreading of a, the very serious fissures in the Republican Party. And if, I, if the voters are sending, not me, but the voters are sending this message, no more business as usual. The Republican Party you've constructed in Washington is disconnected from the voters' concerns. And I'd like to see more signs that people are taking it seriously. And I'll tell you something else. I'd have a lot more respect for Paul Ryan. If he wants to go out and diss Donald Trump, he should do it by name. This kind of namby-pamby stuff about, oh, we want better discourse, I don't even know what that's about. It's not serious. Well, we know, Maggie, we know what, what it's, we we know what it's about. what we know is seriousness. And, you know, I don't well, want to do it I don't by name and take responsibility for it. Don't do the spin thing. We're I don't tired of the spin thing. I am not a Trump supporter, but this is the kind of Washington double, like, nuanced stuff that just drives voters crazy and is partly responsible for the emergence of Trump. Well, Donald, hey, Paul Ryan's in a little difficult spot because he is going to be the chairman of the Republican National Convention. He has a responsibility to remain neutral in that position. Um, but you're right. So maybe don't he should attack and then cover it up. Either don't, yeah, maybe either he say shouldn't say anything at all. Bree, what, what, what do you yeah, think? Well, yeah. Do you agree with Maggie about that? Paul Ryan should just come out if he's going to take on Donald Trump, mention him by name. I don't, don't think so. And stay out of I, the headlines. No, no, no. I don't think so. I think that what Paul Ryan is doing is that he was making a, a very clear point that politics has gotten really ugly this cycle. And right now, the front runner of the Republican Party is a man who hires a team, a staff, a staff of bullies who regularly pull female reporters down and hassle them. Okay, this isn't an isolated incident. Um, and also, I think that it's important to recognize that this is a man who has his literally entire career has been based off of lies and scamming other people. So. Really? I think Wait, let me follow fair. up with you. Let me follow up with you about about Michelle Fields and that incident. You say this is not sure. an isolated incident. What are you talking about? Well, she wasn't. I, I'm saying that she wasn't. She's not the only reporter to face the ire or the wrath or. Uh, okay, I thought because I thought you said the only female reporter. I know there was the incident with the Secret Service agent uh, and the photographer who I believe was from right. the Washington Post. Right, and it's Post. also. Right. Yeah. Well, it's also important to remember that Donald Trump really controls the media at his rallies in ways that none of the other candidates do. He keeps them literally penned up in the back of his events and doesn't allow them to take um, to take shots of the audience and audience reaction and get B-roll that way. He doesn't let them do that. So the way that he's really controlling and manipulating the media and the way that um, he's, you know, the way that the media has been groveling to him in order to get access um, and, the, and the way that they've been playing into this game that he's been doing is really 
um, dangerous. And I think that it's fair for Paul Ryan to talk about this and talk about the political discourse and talk about the talk and the coverage and um, everything surrounding this campaign um, and, and just address those issues specifically. I think that's really fair for him to do. And I think it's, I think there are a lot of people involved with the ugliness of political discourse involved. Um, I mean, it, 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 it does give me some rounds. pause when he talks about, you know, the things he says about the media, calls them scumbags and all that stuff. But to be fair, Hillary Clinton tried to rope off a bunch of reporters back uh, yes. during the summer in Iowa. Yeah. The, the, the President Obama has, has, has limited the access to the media even more than President George W. Bush did. Uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of this going on. I didn't want to get this to turn yeah, into I think those are, I think the, I think those are non-stories. I think the, the public isn't well, well, concerned I, with how... Press reporters are treated at campaign events. To well, me, I mean, my the, problem is more basic. I think Trump. I think Trump. Hold on, hold on, Brie. Let Maggie the economy. I think he'll. I think Trump will not fix the economy. That the things he's proposing will hurt the economy and Main Street. And frankly, I want a man with enough self-control not to get up in public and talk about his private parts on national television. I just can't. You know, he did that once. He attack, you know, he gets up late at night and rants about Megyn Kelly. It's just too weird. It's just too unsettling. You don't know what a man like that will do. He's got a little testosterone oversurge, and hopefully it's not going to be as bad as it looks, but I think he's, it's going to keep him out of the White House, frankly, and I'm sorry for it. Well, that's why we had uh, two women join us on the panel today. We didn't want to have too much testosterone uh, going on today. Uh, enlightening discussion, ladies, and look forward to having you both back here on Newsmax Now real soon. Thank you. All right, coming up, the Justice Department hacks into that San Bernardino terrorist iPhone and drops its suit against Askel, but Apple, but the larger privacy questions remain. Former New York City Police Commissioner Bernie Carrick and former FBI Assistant Director Ron Hosko will weigh in when we come right back.